Sounds good. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, this is part six of the 12-part webinar series on the 90-day business sprint, hosted by Chris Snyder, the CEO and president of the Exit Planning Institute as well as the awarded thought leader of the year. A few housekeeping notes uh, before I turn it over to Chris today. Uh, my name is Drew English. I'm the program coordinator here at the Exit Planning Institute. Uh, these webinars are being recorded and I will be sending the uh, recording out to you after the session today. So just look for an email from me uh, later, th later this afternoon with the recording. And then if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to email me or, or call the office here. I'll be more than happy to help out in uh, any way we possibly can. Uh, but with that, I'll keep it short and sweet. So I'll turn it over to Chris here and we'll dive in for, uh, for today's 90-day business sprint. Chris? Thank you, Drew. Everyone for joining us today. We've got a big group. We've got about uh, 311 registrants for today. So I know a number of you that are on the call are uh, probably the first to join in the series. Uh, as Drew said, uh, may have mentioned, um, uh, the past recordings are available. If you go to my website, you can go back and listen to some of the recordings if you've missed some of the items from earlier in the year as we've gone, as we're walking through the 11. Uh, today's subject, uh, the value maturity. Uh, what I wanted to make you aware of is that uh, over the course of the next four months, we're going to be kind of marching through uh, the rest of the concepts two of walking to destiny. We covered the three legs a couple of months ago uh, when uh, I really talked a lot about uh, personal and how to go through uh, personal envisioning and run workshops and things like that to put your personal plans together. Uh, we covered that in the three legs. Today we're going to cover the five stages of value maturity, the value maturity index. Uh, next month we'll cover the four C's. Uh, the following month we'll cover relentless execution. September, uh, I'll bring that all together for you with a, uh, you know, an overview of the value acceleration methodology, which is, was really a key, you know, important section for me. I know it's very detailed. Um, most people like that. Uh, my suggestion is is that, that people start with section two of the book, read the four core concepts. And if they want to get into the details of actually how to do it, they can read section three, which gives you the details behind value acceleration. But I wanted a book to talk more about than just concepts. But what we want to do over the next few months is we want to uh, make sure that you understand those concepts because these concepts are important for you to adopt and believe in uh, and uh, in order for you to be successful with that. So we'll cover all of these in, in the next few months. Uh, that up, as I said, with a review of the methodology. Um, we are uh, talking about the value maturity using value maturity index. Today we're going to really focus on how do we manage value th uh, through, the, uh, through the index. Uh, we'll uh, uh, define what the value maturity index is, talk about the strategic questions that need to be addressed at each stage of value maturity, we'll review sample actions uh, that are completed and specifically the build phase. I've got a few success stories I want to share with you and then we'll learn at the end how to score your value maturity and use it to increase value. I've got a simple scoring system that you can use uh, that takes about 15 minutes you to do uh, once a quarter uh, to kind of just give yourself a, a sense for how uh, well you're on track to maximize your value. So first question is, you know, what is the value maturity? The value maturity index is really, uh, there are five stages to the index. And I call it an index because uh, is as you move up the index, sort of like the staircase that I have here, you're becoming more and more mature in uh, the, your, uh, uh, the way you're, that you're managing value, or let's, let's call it value management, the way you're uh, managing value within your firm. As your value increases, of course, your personal wealth increases, and so does your business wealth. Um, 
and there are five stages to value maturity. The first is buy, the second is protect, the third is build, the fourth is harvest, and the fifth is manage. And uh, as I said, uh, you really want to step through that in that order, although in most cases uh, you'll find yourself uh, uh, in multiple stages at the same time. The maturity index implies you should not start into a more mature stage until you uh, have at least started in the previous stage. So, in other words, you know, you can't or you shouldn't really, uh, uh, you, know, uh, you can't protect, for example, what you, what you don't know that you have. You can't build what you don't know you have, and you certainly can't harvest and manage it. So the very first step in the process is to identify what you have. And as we talked about in previous uh, uh, webinars, you know, that has to be based on fact, not thought. So, you know, it's, it, uh, you have to go out and you do what we talked about before, a, a triggering event, a personal financial business assessment to get your attractiveness and readiness score. You correlate that into the range of value to figure out uh, what your valuation is and uh, that time you're going to have the facts from the assessment and the interview in order to justify that valuation. Once you've identified what you have, then you can move into that state, right? And you want to protect before you build. Uh, and we'll get into this in a little bit more detail in a second as we go through each of the, the uh, components here. But you want to protect before you build. And most owners that I talk to would indicate, uh, listen, Chris, I, I'm interested in growth, but I, I don't, I'm not willing to risk everything to achieve it. Um, and, uh, you know, I want to make sure that I don't lose everything if I, if I launch down this path. So protect is something you need to do before you build. Um, uh, and then your next stage would be build. At some point in your future, you're going to want to harvest. And the most mature stage is manage. And I put manage last because manage sort of represents the most mature stage. Uh, and you're going to be managing... You don't want to just do it at the end uh, after you've harvested, doing it uh, before and after. So you want to look at how we're managing overall value in a holistic basis, not just business value, but our holistic net worth uh, as we move through the process. So what do we do and identify? Basically, uh, we covered a lot of this over the last couple of webinars, so I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but uh, in identity, uh, it correlates to the, to the discover gate of the value acceleration methodology. And basically, if you remember, you're going to have two scores, an attractiveness and a readiness score. And if you recall what we talked about previously, there's a difference between being attractive and being ready. Um, and if you were this for the previous webinars, you can go back uh, onto my website. You can pull up that old webinar and, uh, and review it. I would suggest you do that if you're not familiar with the concepts of attractiveness and readiness. So you're going to come out of that identify stage with an attractiveness and, and readiness. Score. You're going to correlate that scores or those scores to the range, figure out where you place in the range of value. Uh, and as a result, you're going to understand both your current value, but maybe more importantly, is what your potential value, what, you, what your business could be worth if uh, you were able to improve on those value factors, thus improving your attractiveness and readiness scores. The other uh, achievement in the identified value stage is fact versus think. So if you remember, we talked about you know, uh, readiness as a state of fact, not a state of mind. Um, you have to have proof. You have to have backup for these things. So you might say, I'm going to grow the business by 20% a year. Well, what, uh, have, do you have a historical track record of being able to do that? Can you show me successful campaigns? So uh, going through attractiveness and readiness and, and in the identify stage, you're going to have the details to support that valuation, which is going to allow you to be on the same page as your team and allow you to be on the same page as whoever might be looking at uh, whoever the future owner might be, whether that's an insider or 
on-site buyer. Um, and then finally, remember the, the uh, uh, final step in the uh, discover gate of our methodology, which is also in the identify value stage, is to develop an action plan. So now, you know, I've done this formal assessment. I have my, my facts. I know what my strengths and weaknesses are from an attractiveness and readiness standpoint. I've correlated that to the range of value so I know what my present value is. And more importantly, I know what my potential value could be if I improve these factors. Now I need to put together an action plan to actually go out and do something about it. I see your three strategic questions in my phase or stage are, do I know what my business is worth today and its potential worth? And like I say, what I find is that many owners are more excited about the second half of that question, what the potential is, and to have quantifiable data, what the potential could be worth uh, if you were to pursue those value factors. Have you identified the specific value factors that, if approved, would achieve this higher valuation? And then the third one is, is it worth it? Uh, you know, not everybody is uh, in a growth mindset. Or, or wants to grow at hyper growth. Um, they may, you might be satisfied with the number that you have today. Those are your choices as an owner. It's up to you, you know, what you want to do. Uh, you have to make the choice as to whether or not you want to make the investment in resources, time and money, uh, to uh, go after that increased value. And as we'll look in the build stage, you know, building value is a risky proposition and you have to make that determination. Um, but what you want to know is, you know, that's your choice. You want to be able to say, uh, uh, you want to have that choice. You want to have, be able to say, um, you know, I'm going to choose to stay where I am versus going for a higher number. But you can't make that choice if you don't know what that higher number is. Right? So you need to understand what that gap is. We call that the profit gap and value gap. You need to understand what those gaps are, and then you can make, uh, you know, a good decision based on fact on what you want to do. Uh, one of the things that uh, a lot of owners will tell me as they after they go through that first stage is that the number one thing that it delivered was clarity. So a lot of uh, owners, when they first come to me, they come to me because they're not sure what to do. Uh, and uh, they'll be referred to me because whoever they're talking to, whoever referred them, will say, look, talk to Chris, and I'll spend a little time with him. He'll figure, help you figure out uh, what's your best direction, what's the best way to go for you. So I think clarity is what you get out of that identify value stage because, again, you have the facts. You, you can quantify how big that gap is, and, and then you can do some soul searching and figure out whether... A few years ago, I had a client that was in that situation, and I, I, uh, I did the valuation, and I came back, and I said to him, the good news is you're saleable right now. Uh, we could take you to market right now, and I could sell you for X. But I said, looking at your attractiveness and readiness and your value gap, I think if you held this business and worked with us for a few years, I think you could sell the business for three times what we could get, to, uh, what we could get for it today. And so uh, using those facts, he went back, spent some time with his wife and talked it over. And he came back to me and he said, Chris, I, I, I know I'm leaving money on the table, uh, but I, I just soon go right now. And the reason is that uh, he knew what he needed uh, and he was able to, uh, we were able to get that number uh, that would take care of him and his family the rest of their lives. Um, and he wasn't really willing and didn't want to take on the risk to try to go for that 3x number because there was no, there's no guarantee that can be delivered. That's a risk. Uh, and he really just didn't want to put in the effort to take on the risk to achieve it. But my point here is that that was a conscious choice based on facts, not based on hearsay, not based on what he heard at the country club. It's based on facts, and, uh, and that provided the clarity that he and his wife needed to uh, make that decision. As I said, the number one uh, deliverable in this entire process event, it's a business valuation correlated to a personal financial business attractiveness and readiness assessment to determine where the business value lies 
on the range of value. This is the first step in the value acceleration uh, methodology. It is always first, and it should never be skipped because it gives you the, bank, the facts uh, on which to make all of your future decisions. And if you recall, we talked about action plans, which you're going to get coming out of triggering event is this list of stuff that you can work on. Um, and there'll be a long list of things. And the first thing you're going to do coming out of triggering event is you need to spend some time putting together a plan that makes execution requirements clear. Um, so we're going to take this uh, list, uh, and we know that if we implement the items on this list, uh, we understand quantifiably how much value that's going to drive. We're going to set five business, no more than five business, and five personal actions that you're going to complete over 90-day sprints. You're going to determine who needs to be involved, and you're going to define what the deliverables are. So a key, uh, another key deliverable within the identify value phase is uh, the action plan itself. And also, if you recall, we talked about the, how are we going to go about putting these action plans together, we're going to do, uh, we're going to do this via the concept of workshops, not meetings. And um, meetings, I'm not saying meetings aren't important. They're important to have. They're a good communication tool, or at least can be. But the idea of a workshop is uh, more targeted at what we're trying to do. We're going to come into a workshop. We're going to get the right people in the room. We're going to allocate two or three hours. We know what our outcome needs to be. We're going to work towards that outcome within the time frame allotted, and we're going to get some things done. And uh, as I've gone through so far through the series, I've shown you a number of different workshops. Last month, we went through a whole series of workshops we do to prepare our action plans. And when we get into relentless execution, we'll talk about some of the workshops we use to help us be better implemented. I want you to think in the terms of the concept of workshops not meetings. Um, and uh, if you're not sure of the difference between the two, send me a note and I'll be happy to explain it to you. The, uh, the next stage of value maturity is protect value. So de-risking is the first priority of actions post-triggering event. Um, they are the first set of actions implemented after identifying value in the discover gate of value acceleration methodology and owners would indicate that their first priority is to protect what they already have, especially if you're over 50. Um, uh, you're going to start to become less, uh, you're going to start to become risk averse as you get a little bit older because you want to make sure that all your hard work uh, isn't lost on a risky venture. What you need to understand is that risk is a major factor in determining value. Um, from that standpoint, uh, you've got to understand the way valuations are done. It's really all in the eyes of the behold, uh, uh, the business value is in the eyes of the buyer. And anytime the buyer feels, it doesn't even have to be factual. Anytime the buyer feels risk or more risk, uh, the price is going down. Anytime the buyer feels more comfortable, typically the price is, is going to be going up. And so one aspect of risk is making the buyer feel comfortable uh, that the uh, risk is, on the business is mitigated. Any business has risk. We all know that. Those of us who are entrepreneurs, we, we live with risk all the time. But uh, there's a certain line that you cross where the business becomes too risky. Think back to CWR that I talked about uh, over the last couple of months. That looked like a pretty strong business. We had 15% uh, compound annual sales growth. We had 27% compound annual EBITDA over the previous three year periods. Certainly that business looked strong, uh, but as we looked at the business in more detail, we looked at the facts, attractiveness and readiness facts, we found a lot of issues that would make us feel that that business was too risky to be sold or to be transitioned to somebody on the inside. It was likely that they wouldn't be able to sustain those growth rates uh, given the amount of risk that business had. The other thing is what the business, what is, what are you, the business owner, willing to lose if the, business, if the build strategy fails? Uh, building a business, uh, as all of you are aware, because you build businesses now, is an enormous 
task. It's an enormous job. And it's filled with risk. Uh, clearly from identify value, we have present and potential value. So we know what we'll gain. But we need to realize that building is risky. And we have to take and consider that risk in relation to our risk profile. And that is really going to be partially determined time and how much time you have left. Where are you in your business life cycle? So the strategic questions in the protect stage are, have I integrated risk management into my business model and personally today? Remember, we're not just looking at business risk. We have to look at our personal and financial risk as well. Ask yourself, do I take risk seriously enough? Now, one of the things that I find interesting is that the, because uh, I work with both advisors and owners, and, and I'm myself, an advisor and an owner, is that uh, advisors and owners perceive risk very differently. To give you an example, in one of my roundtables, uh, uh, as I went around the, uh, the owners who were sitting at the roundtables and I asked them about risk, they felt their least risky invi uh, investment was their business, right? Uh, they were hesitant to turn over their assets, specifically 80% of their assets, which is in their business, their financial assets over to a financial planner, um, because they felt that they were the, the best uh, uh, person to oversee their wealth and manage their wealth. And they really felt uh, that their business wasn't that risky at all. Now, if you were to talk to a, uh, an advisor, who looked at your portfolio and included the business in it, they'd never recommend that you put 80% of your wealth into one asset, which is basically what we do with our businesses. Uh, because in most cases, the business is 80%, sometimes even 90% of our wealth. Uh, no uh, financial advisor would suggest that you do that uh, with your portfolio. So, uh, but the point here is that owners view risk much differently than advisors view risk. But I, I'm telling you, uh, as an owner to owner, uh, the facts are that business uh, is very risky, which is why the rates of return on business investments need to be so much higher and the cost of capital is so much higher on middle market privately held businesses. The fact is that 50% of business owners will be affected by one of the five Ds and forced into an exit. And that's just a fact. I mean, we have, we, we have proof of that. That's pretty risky when you think that 80% of your wealth is tied to that one asset. So really ask yourself, do some soul searching. Do I take risk seriously enough? Uh, and given that, have I really integrated it into my business model and my personal model today? What is... Uh, the business owner willing to lose if the strategy fails. What can you lose if the strategy fails? You know, uh, going forward, like I say, in a build strategy, it has inherent risk. Um, what are you willing to lose? Odds are, you know, as entrepreneurs, we never think we're going to lose. <laughs> we wouldn't be doing these things if we did. We think we're going to win, but we need to be prepared in case something doesn't work out. And I haven't really met uh, a real entrepreneur that hasn't failed in a few things during the course of their life, including myself. Uh, protected value, these are your risk areas, personal, financial, business. I want to make sure, you know, as we remember, we had to move along on the three legs of the stool, personal, financial, business. Uh, these are the types of things. Uh, there's lots of risk areas, right? You've got the five Ds on personal. You've got health issues, accidents, family tragedies that could pull you away from the business. On the financial side, you got market risks, diversification, loss of earning power, long-term care is starting to really be a, a heavy uh, weighing factor on, on aging business owners. And from a business standpoint, there's tons of things that we need to address as we're going through protect value. Deal killers, I want to just point these out. These are typical deal killers right off the bat. Owner dependence. Uh, lack of documentation, lack of transferable, scalable systems, product liability, any kind of product liability, an EPA or safety violation or lawsuits are just going to kill the deal. But it's not just those things. Those are kind of obvious. Owner dependence will kill a deal, like in the case of CWR, right? All of those customer relationships, even though that business was growing at 15% compound annual growth rate, all of those relationships 
We're with the owner. If something happens to the owner, where do the relationships go? And the other problem he had, of course, is that uh, that his alliance share, his revenue, was made up with just a few customers. So he had a customer concentration problem as well. But he had a customer concentration, owner dependence. Those are two big uh, deal killers for sure. And of course, lack of documentation. We talk about the importance of structural capital. Um, you can say you do this, but do you have the proof? Can you transfer the asset? Can you transfer your intellectual property, your intangible assets? We can. We, it's pretty easy to transfer a tangible asset um, as long as you own the asset, right? And you don't have anything tight attached to it. But it's really transferability of the intangible assets that you have to be thinking about. And that's done through structural capital and documentation. Let's move into build uh, value. So build value, uh, uh, well, before I jump into that, it's important for you to know that protecting value is actually the first step to building value. I broke it out just because I think it's very important that you go through that risk assessment and do a risk mitigation process before launching into a growth strategy. But protecting value, if you do nothing else but just de-risk, you will add value to your business by just doing that simply alone. Just all, always understand, lower my risk, raise my value. Uh, building values achieved through relentless execution of 90-day sprints. And we're going to get into those over the next couple of months. It's, I think in actually August we're going to get into relentless execution. We've talked a little bit about that already. Uh, it's a team effort focused on the number one goal. Remember what the number one goal is. That's value growth. That's what we're after. We're after number one goal of any business owner should be uh, growing value. And the other thing you want to do is you want to re-score uh, frequently and don't give up. So as you move through the build phase, taking those value factors that were on the weaker end uh, that we've identified in identified value, uh, we're going to start addressing those weaknesses and we're going to be moving our scores from twos and threes and fours up to fours, fives and sixes if we can get there. Uh, as you raise those factors, as you implement you raise your score and ultimately raise your value. What you want to do is the beauty of having the triggering event is it becomes a management tool because you can go back to that, those same interview questions and you can rescore yourself and you can literally watch the impact on your value right in front of your eyes. And uh, the other thing I would mention to you is the biggest mistake I see owners making is they give up. A change is really difficult. And your first uh, couple of cycles uh, in the prepare uh, gate of our methodology in the build stage are going to be very difficult because we're really changing behavior, we're changing processes, and uh, the biggest mistake I see owners make is they say, look, it's just too much trouble, there's too much chaos, it's too disruptful, I'm giving up. Um, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Strategic questions, where should we focus to get the biggest bang for the buck? Your prioritization process is going to help you with that. Are we ready for growth? Uh, remember, you want to do efficiency before growth. We'll talk about that in a second, right? You can't just grow. You have to be ready to grow. So one of the things I often say is if you're not ready to transition, you're not ready to grow. The very things that you would do to prepare your business to transition are the very same things you would prepare your business to grow. So either way, regardless of which direction you choose, uh, you have to do those things. How do we sustain the action and thereby improvements over the long term? That's going to be a, a, a challenging task, but it's going to be critical to keeping the programs going over time because the best benefits, the largest benefits, come at the end of the cycle, not in the beginning. And have we appropriately addressed the resources to actually implement the strategy? We talked a little bit about this prior to in the book uh, Execution from Larry Bossidy. Um, Right? Most strategies are not wrong. It's just that we failed to go far enough with them to actually consider how it was going to be implemented. I wrote section three of, of Walking to Destiny is I felt like there are a lot of books out there about concepts, like this one, but there weren't a lot of books out there that said, okay, I get the concept. This makes sense to me. How do I do it? And that's what section three of the book is about. It's, okay, if you buy into the four core concepts, then I'm going to tell you how you do it step by step in a section three. There's four chapters in section three. If you really want to learn how to do it and actually execute it and make it real, uh, you read that chapter. 
Here's a few uh, examples um, of companies that I've been involved with. This was a company um, that I started working with in 2013. You can see uh, their sales were around 10 million back then. And we did a value the evaluation of the business. I think it came out to be around 4.7, 4.6. And uh, coming out of the triggering event, we obviously had a whole list of things we wanted to do and could do. And here how uh, their sales have consistently grown over time um, and are now, uh, you know, we had about uh, three, you know, pretty strong years of growth, growing the business from 10 million to a little over 16 million, 60% um, over three years. Um, and now we're even on a more accelerated process now that we've gotten further in our implementation cycles, which I'll show you in a second. Uh, and again, in the beginning, we were doing some de-risking. Um, we're doing some modeling, some strategy. We're, we're looking for quick hits now. And then we got into this sort of efficiency, building scalable businesses. Now that when we did that for three years, now we're really on an acceleration of growth, a scalable growth, and sustainable growth. And we think that uh, by 2019, uh, we'll be at about 30 million. We'll have tripled. Uh, sales in the business over that period of time, and we were pr pretty uh, uh, very confident already at this point that we'll we'll hit 20 million, which will have doubled the business uh, in a period of four years. You can see in the bottom red line there, uh, we valued the business originally at around four six, I think four seven. We're, we're projecting that by the time we get out to 2019, that business is going to be worth over 21 million dollars. Um, that's a that's an increase of over 500 percent in uh, uh, from its valuation in 2013, uh, and you're looking at you know roughly about 60, a little over 16 million dollars in wealth creation as a result of these uh, value acceleration efforts. The other thing you'll notice there is that the, not only has their as their sales have grown, their EBITDA has grown. I didn't show the EBITDA line. Their EBITDA as a percent of sales has actually grown. So not only have we added consistent cash, we're adding uh, a greater percentage of every dollar of sales to profits. And the other thing is we've raised the multiple. So their multiple uh, is significantly higher uh, and will be significantly higher in 2019 than it was in 2013. So all of those factors you know, uh, the, the increase in the sales, the increase in the cash, combined with an increase in the multiple, are giving us this exponential effect in growth. Uh, and, but you can see, you know, it's, uh, it's taken us three years to double the business. Uh, and, and, and basically, I think we've got the most recent valuation at somewhere up around nine, ten million million. Um, we basically have doubled the value, but that will all accelerating now as we move forward. Here was a company uh, that was doing about uh, close to 10 million in revenue, 9.4 million, uh, was losing about $700,000 a year. Um, at the time, I questioned whether or not it had any value. You know, um, they were sitting on about 2 million in debt. Um, and this goes back to um, uh, as we had the triggering event, we came out into uh, our uh, uh, developing action plans uh, stage uh, of our methodology, we we came out really with four core themes. Remember, we talked about the importance of themes. Uh, we wanted to clean up the balance sheet. Uh, we wanted to reduce expenses, redefine the brand, and rationalize the customer base. From an owner standpoint, uh, the owner was looking to achieve eight to ten million into the estate within the next 10 years. So by 2016, um, we had sort of convinced him to sell a portion of the company to eliminate the personal debt. Uh, we needed to bring in new operating leadership and get the owner out of the day-to-day. -day. That was not his best and highest use. And we wanted to double the sales and achieve a 20% EBITDA. Now we're pretty far from those objectives when you look at those original numbers. Uh, three years later, uh, we were up around 10.8 million. Um, that's not a huge sales increase, but that really wasn't what we were after. What we found with this particular client was they were they were chasing some bad deals, uh, and they had some bad customers that they needed to let go of. Uh, so, 
but we really had to go through a customer rationalization process and really target in on those customers that were going to give us the best bang for the buck. Uh, so we did a lot of that. Uh, we uh, got EBITDA from a loss of 700000 to a profit of, of $1.4 million. So that's about a $2 million turnaround. Uh, and we estimated the value uh, at that point to be about $6.2 million. Um, what we had done is we eliminated the debt uh, for a 60% stake in the company. Uh, we've got the owner out of the day-to-day. -day. Uh, the focus, his focus and his best and highest use was building out the brand. Owner had an excellent reputation in the industry. Been in that industry for 35 years, and we really needed him out there uh, building the brand uh, and sharing his knowledge and experience and not running the company. So we brought in a new COO. Our gross margin went up 17% because of better customer selection. We dropped the operating costs by 38%. Um, and the owner's estimated value is $2.5 million uh, with no debt at this point. And remember, he took a million dollars out when we sold 60% uh, of the company to, uh, uh, to a buyer uh, uh, in order to eliminate the debt. Here was another situation, a uh, $4.5 million company, we started working with them, uh, doing about 350000 in EBITDA, uh, industry average uh, uh, was about 20%, so they were definitely underperforming uh, within their industry. We estimated the value back in 2002 at $1.4 million, about four times. Uh, the industry average was, the, uh, a multiple was between five and seven times. Um, this was a tech company, so we were, uh, you know, pretty much uh, working in the high tech, you know, high end, high, good size multiples. This is also back in 2002, um, uh, and because of they were underperforming, we, we didn't even have them up. We had them well, well below average at, at four times is what we figured was probably the best we could do at that time. Our solution centers versus commodity, we had to get out of the commodity business. We had to uh, enhance the management talent. We needed some rainmakers. We needed people who, if we're going to go to a solution center versus commodity business, we needed people who could manage solutions. Uh, we needed to improve gross margin by 10 plus percent. One of the things we learned is that, uh, remember this was a four and a half million dollar business at the time, uh, we wanted to get after million dollar accounts. Uh, for every million dollar account we could add, there was about $500,000 of what we call tag-along revenue. Um, and so it became a, an objective of ours to add one or two million dollar accounts every year. And as a result of that, we knew that that would, would really bring along another 500000 to a million dollars in sales. So one or two big accounts per year. And we want, the only way we were going to be able to achieve that Fortune 500 companies. Um, the owner's goals were $15 million in three years, consistency planning, buy-sell insurance, all his personal planning. None of that was done. Uh, bringing a new operating leadership. Again, get the owner out of the day-to-day, -day, um, triple sales, and achieve a 20% EBITDA. Uh, you're, finding, you're seeing a theme there. That's typically one of the things that I like to do coming in. After value enhancement in 2005, um, we were able to grow the company three years later to $12.2 million. 39.4% compound annual growth rate. We raised the EBIT up to 2.68, around 22%. So a little bit now above industry standard. Uh, and we estimated the value to be 21.5 million. Uh, that's by basically $20 million more than what it was worth three years prior. And a big reason for that was not just the turnaround in the financial performance, but the, but the multiple. Now, instead of trading below the average range, uh, now they're trading above the average range, and I wasn't sure that eight was going to even be. I think I, I actually thought like nine or ten might be a better number. Um, some of the things that we did, uh, we brought in some senior partners, uh, each who were required to drive two to four million a year. Uh, the owner got out of the day to day, uh, again focused on building the brand. Uh, we added a new COO, a new VP of Sales. Uh, we developed five solution centers or what we called practices. We raised rates and utilization levels above uh, industry standard. Our margin moved from 31% to 45%. So no longer commodity business. At 45%, 30%, you're probably still a commodity business. 
you got to get up to at least 35. Uh, most uh, insiders will tell you your business, your gross margin has to be 40% or above to be considered a non-commodity business. We are now doing 45%. Uh, because we're really focused on solutions and not just providing heads. Um, we developed incentives based on gross margin, not sales, because one of the things we found is because of the heavy sales focus, we found people were out just selling stuff, which we weren't making any money on. So we, we rebuilt the incentive system around gross margin uh, because we're really, our real goal when you think about it was to really drive that gross margin number to 45%. Uh, anything uh, below the goal had to receive a partner uh, two partner approvals in order for the proposal to still be presented, and the SGNA was was uh, held to 23% of sales. Uh, this business sold for uh, 60 million dollars three years uh, after we were finished working with it. So basically, if you look at that, one million to uh, 60 million over uh, six years, or seven years, I guess that'd be. Um, before, last example, uh, before value enhancement, I wanted to present a small company because, uh, uh, you know, one that's in the micro market, because there's a tendency for us to ignore businesses that are in that micro market. Um, and, uh, but these practices, they work for any size company, right? Uh, somebody asked me the other day, you know, if I worked with small companies, uh, and I said, yeah, they're willing to, you know, pay, you know, pay the, <laughs> pay, willing to pay the, the price of, of, of bringing uh, one of our folks in. Why wouldn't I work with them? You know, um, so uh, it, and, and some of these, I think, smaller companies, really small companies, the ones that are under two million dollars, they tend to think they can't afford it. But there's usually creative ways uh, to, to, uh, that you can participate. Uh, and, and still get benefits from value acceleration. So this this was a, a very specific case. I want to just give you an example. It was a one-year deal. Uh, at the time we started working with them, they were doing about 1.2 million. It's a pretty small company, uh, about only about 216,000 in EBITDA, uh, below industry average. Uh, we estimated the value of only $540,000, which is about two and a half, you know, a little bit on the lower end of the industry average range. <clears throat> Basically, the owner had decided that he wanted to exit within the next year. Um, we knew that there were some profit improvement programs, and there was a sales program, uh, and some expense re reductions that needed to get implemented uh, before the business went to market. There were some staffing reductions. There was some talk about, hey, let the buyer do it. But you don't want to turn that stuff over to the buyer. You know, we needed to do it now. Uh, don't wait for the buyer to do that. Uh, because what that does is, you know, if we clean it all up, remember, it not only will raise our cash flow, but it will raise our multiple. Um, we wanted to document marketing programs because the company had pretty strong marketing for its size and develop some management reporting so we could show the buyer how, uh, how this owner who had owned this business for a significant number of years had been managing the business over all these years. From a personal standpoint, uh, for the owner, set personal goals, discuss them with family, establish his outside team. Uh, he needed to do a needs versus wants analysis because he wasn't sure we could get, you know, uh, you know, as much as he wanted for the business. And uh, uh, he needed to do a net proceeds analysis and tax planning. I mean, he needed to get those things done if we were going to exit this business over the next year. So um, a year later, uh, we were able to grow the revenue to $1.3 million. Um, EBITDA grew to uh, 286000 and the business sold for a little over a million dollars, just almost double what it was worth when we first got in there. Uh, you know, this, there was a new program certification, added uh, $250,000 of annualized revenue. That program alone was just critical. We knew about that program going in. It was just critical that we got it implemented, um, and we began to, and we could demonstrate that the program was fully implemented and operational, was uh, generating $250,000. Uh, and again, like in the last case, we actually had to eliminate some other things we were doing uh, to compensate, to, to have the resources to go after this particular program. Large and multiple justified. Uh, cost to implement this program was $32,800. We generated almost $500,000 in uh, additional value to the business. Clearly, um, uh, uh, a, a good investment by this particular owner. 
that just gives you a few of the examples. What are we doing in the build stage? Well, here's a list of the different kinds of things that are going on in the build stage. Remember, you're going to come out of triggering event. You're going to have all this stuff. You're going to put some themes together. Uh, you're going to put some projects together. Uh, you're going to develop some milestones. There's a series of things that, a whole series of possibilities from the business standpoint, and a whole other set of actions that you'll be doing from a personal and financial standpoint. Remember, in the prepare gate, which is really where the build stage resides, is you're running two concurrent paths, both a set of personal financial actions will be going on and a set of uh, business actions. Remember, successful exit, as Peter Christmas says, requires all three legs of the stool be addressed, and that's the process of what we call master planning. Now, what, how do you prioritize all these things? We'll get into some more of this detail uh, a little bit later. We've talked about some of it, but we suggest you follow this sort of plane. You start with de-risking, then you develop strategy, business modeling, you move on to efficiency, you move into growth, and then ultimately you're going to, I think what you do is you realize your cultures. We're aware of culture, we're doing things to develop culture, but in reality, uh, I believe that culture is realized based on all the other things that you're doing. We'll spend a little bit more time on that when we get into relentless execution. Uh, uh, because, I, I, you know, uh, become a company that relentlessly executes requires that you've done all, all of these other things. Again, I present these concepts as linear concepts, but in rea reality, it's not linear at all. So most owners that I go through with this, they'll say, hey, yeah, I've got a couple projects, efficiency projects going on. I still have uh, some you know, strategic venture I'm, I'm doing over here. I've got these growth initiatives over here. Once you get started, you will probably have uh, some priorities in each one of these categories. But generally, what you're going to have is a dominant theme. So, you know, coming out of triggering event, the first thing you want to do to protect value is you're probably going to be doing de-risking things. Once you've de-risked, mitigated those things, then you're probably going to be saying, okay, now I've mitigated risk. Let's look at my strategy. Where am I going to go with this thing longer term? You want to build scalable systems through efficiency so that when you get into the growth mode, you don't have this choppy growth where, you know, you get a big win and then you collapse the organization, the resources, because they're, they're not built to sustain that kind of growth. So what we're looking for is sustainable growth uh, over the long period of time. And again, if you've done all those other things, you're going to have a culture. Now, as you go through these priorities, understand this, that, uh, you know, item number one, de-risking type activities, uh, take the least amount of effort, time, money, um, but they also produce the least amount of value. So they still add value. As I said, protect value is the first stage to build value, but they don't add a lot of value. Uh, your, your, your pinnacle is really when you get up to the culture. You get to a point where you got great culture. Uh, great culture adds a tremendous amount of value, the most value you can add, but it most work, right? So these themes, as you uh, categories of priorities are done over a period of years. I want you to think like this is done over a period of months. This is done over a period of years. It takes years to build a really good culture, right? Now, one of the things I wanted to point out before we move out of build value is a, is a concept that was created by Craig West of SEPA in Australia. And I always love this concept um, because, you know, as we talk about it, uh, what Craig does in the beginning of an assignment with a client is he, he presents what he calls the wow curve. I haven't drawn this wow curve that greatly, but you'll get the point. The point here is that on the wow curve, what we're doing is the, uh, the, on the left side, we're measuring enthusiasm of the owner and the owner's team. And then down at the bottom, we're looking at time. What we typically see is in the beginning when we come in, the enthusiasm is very, very high. Once we ask for the information that we need to do the triggering event, uh, the enthusiasm drops because the owner says, oh my God, what did I get myself into? And then once we deliver the results, uh, the owner's super pleased and probably is looking at their business like they've never had before. And then you have this slow, long decline over a period of several months where we go from very excited, we're implementing de-risking, and eventually we're into efficiency, and then we get to a point where we kind of hit the bottom. And then, as you can see, we start to move back up again uh, after we hit the bottom. And Craig does something which I think is, is very creative. And what he does, he tells his clients about this from the very beginning. 
And he says, when you hit rock bottom, I'm going to send you a bottle of champagne to remind you that you've hit rock bottom and it's nothing but up from here. <laughs> because the point of this is your biggest challenge is going to be sustaining this process over a long term. As I said, the biggest mistake I see owners make is they give up. They get so overwhelmed during that period. Like change is hard. We need vision to inspire us to get to work through the change. In the beginning, the de-risking things aren't too disruptive. But as you start to get into efficiency and growth, it starts to become disruptive. I'm going to change the way you do your job because I want you to do it more efficiently. I'm going to put this new system in, this new technology, because it's going to help you increase your capacity uh, and improve your productivity. But those kinds of things are generally people will resist, and uh, they're very difficult to do. And what I see is sometimes the owners will come back after nine months and just say, look, there's just too much noise. Uh, i got to cut this off. And they give up. Um, and I think that what you have to do is remember that it's not easy to do this, but if you can get past that inflection point, you're home free. And that inflection point is likely to come about 12 months after you start your program. Stage four is harvest value. Uh, I love this. I think I could summarize it in this quote from Winston Churchill. I felt as if I were walking with destiny and that all my past life had been a preparation for this hour and this trial. I thought I knew a good deal about it all. I was sure I should not fail. And this was really what he was saying is I was been preparing my whole life for this uh, day, um, for this event in my life. And in effect, when you're working on your business, you're doing the same thing. If you get to a point where the big uh, event comes, your opportunity to harvest that wealth, and you haven't been prepared and getting yourself prepared, you're going to miss out on that opportunity because it's just the fact is that harvesting a business is a multi-year, difficult, um, uh, expensive, time-consuming thing to do. And it can be terribly disruptive. It's all those things, and none of them sound good until you get that big hunk of money <laughs> that uh, you've been working your whole life for. And the value, your net worth grows by a factor of four to five times. But I'm just telling you, if you haven't prepared, if you haven't identified, protected, and been building, uh, you're never going to be able to get uh, to harvest the wealth of your business. And the fact is that at some point in your life, you are going to want and need to harvest your wealth. And you need to understand that there's a 50% chance this will not be on your timeline. And preparation is your key to achieve your destiny. The three questions in, in harvest value, do I want to keep growing or do I want to exit? The first thing you should be doing, this ties to the decide gate of the methodology. What you want to do is you want to bring exit planning into the present and you want to ask yourself, do I want to keep growing or am I ready to exit? Because depending on which decision you tie your commitment to do one or the other. And so what we like to do is we like you to ask that question every 90 days. Re-up, recommit to growing the business, or decide you've had enough and I want to go in other directions. What's wrong with that at all? Really up to you. But again, it should be a kind that you're making, uh, not one that's forced upon you. Have you explored all of your options? I'd say in at least half the well, more than half the cases. When I go into an owner, they haven't explored all their options. And and they I will I've had owners think they wanted to sell and end up doing an ESOP you know, think they wanted to uh, transition to a family member and then sell them the business outright. You need to explore all your options. You need to give yourself time to explore all your options. Remember from our state of owner readiness survey, 66% of owners said that they were not aware of all their options. And the last questions are really, am I ready? Are you personally ready? And is your business ready? You know, is your structural capital in place that if your intellectual property can be transferred to a buyer? If you decide you want to cash in, if you decide it is time to exit, there's basically seven ways to do that. IPO is a valid option, but it's not one that we typically see a lot of uh, middle market privately held uh, companies doing, so we, so we kind of gray that one out. You basically have four inside options and four outside options. And which option you choose, it doesn't matter. You need to do identify, protect, and build regardless of which option that you choose. Um, you can go to my website at SnyderValueIndex.com and download an article I wrote uh, called Are You Ready? It's a checklist of 10 things to check if you are. And I would suggest you go do that. It's a simple little tool that you can do. 
something I would hand out to uh, owners uh, before I would go out to see them. And usually they fill it out. It just kind of gives you a little checklist. The last and most mature stage is manage value. And remember, what we're doing is it's the most mature stage because we want to manage value holistically. We want to manage both business value and personal value. And we want to look at that in the context holistically. And we need to be able to, we want to be able to do that before the exit as well as after the exit, right? So how should your managed value uh, strategy change as you move through value acceleration? It will change. It will be different depending on where you are in your business life cycle and in your personal life cycle. Income to support my lifestyle, uh, lifestyle without the income for the business. You need to know what your needs versus wants are. I know we all want to sell the business a million, but if you got 10, uh, uh, you know, is that really all you need? And is it possible to have multiple exits? And in the future, I'm going to have a friend of mine, Sean Hutchinson, uh, who's now out of the Denver area, uh, talk about this. this is a concept that he's pursuing. A lot of us look at the exit as a once-in-a-lifetime uh, process. And uh, what Sean is suggesting, and I think is very thought-provoking, is that maybe we should be looking at having multiple exits along the way. We're taking chips off the table along the way instead of looking at exit as a once-in-a-lifetime event. And I think if there's something you're interested in, you know, shoot me an email, uh, and I'll see if I can't get Sean to do a, a webinar for us on that particular subject. Now, I'm going to leave you, I promise you, with a scoring system. If you remember, we use common sense scoring. So it's on a scale of one to six, with six being the strongest, one being the weakest. There is no average. Uh, you're going to start in the middle, and you're going to work out. So it's too easy to see your average. So what we want to do is we start out and say, okay, we're going to look at this item, and we have to decide, are we slightly below average, a three, or are we slightly above average of four, and then we go out from there. If we're slightly above, well, how far above? Five or six is typically best in class. One or two means you haven't done anything at all. Three or four means you're somewhere in the middle. So, for example, what you can do is a simple way to sort of just test yourself. Again, I trust owner's instincts. Common sense scoring, right? Go in and score each of, your, uh, uh, each of the components of the value maturity index. Uh, the maximum score in each category is 6, so your total maximum score would be 30. You could score yourself in each case. In this case, I scored this business 4, 3, 2, 3, 3. They got a total score of 15, so he's got a uh, 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 basically an unsaleable, untransferable business. Anything less than 16 is not saleable, nor is it transferable. You will not be able to harvest the wealth of your business if you score below 16. 16 to 19 means you're going to leave money on the table, right? You're not getting all that you deserve. Uh, there are improvements that could be made to drive your value up. If you get 20 or above, it's what we call the green zone. Congratulations. That means you're, you're going to get what you're worth, um, and maybe if you can get up to 22 plus, you're going to get a best in class or a premier number. But remember, how you score here is going to be tied to your range of multiples. So if you're in a particular market where the range of multiples is say three to nine, you know, and you're scoring less than uh, you're scoring 16 and 19, it probably means you're probably somewhere in the three to five range. If remember, if you're less than 16, you're probably at zero, right? If you're at 20, that means you're probably going to get slightly above whatever in that particular industry. And if you're at 22 and above, you're going to be you're going to be trading up at eight nine. So you can do the math in your head pretty easy. If you understand your recast at EBITDA, and you understand that you can move that multiple by one, two, three times, depending on your maturity index, pretty easy for you to figure out uh, what it's worth. Uh, one of the things I'll do in my round tables, I have the owners do it, simply draw a circle, draw the uh, five stages around the outside of the circle, label them, draw an inner circle, uh, and then connect that out. And then uh, basically put six hash marks on each one of those lines and then go around and score yourself. That area outside the shaded area on the inside is really your opportunity. The larger the inside circle, the greater the value of your company. Now, this is a simple exercise. You can sit down once a quarter and just say, look, uh, what would I score my how well I've identified value, right? And you can just, you know, use your gut, use your instinct come up with a simple score to kind of keep yourself on track. If you did that every quarter, 
if nothing else, it's going to keep the value maturity index top of mind for you. Uh, next month, uh, so, so your homework this month is to do your value maturity index score. Um, all of this, of course, can be found in my book, um, Walking to Destiny. I encourage you to pick up a copy. If you haven't, please share it your peer groups. Um, if you've gotten some benefit from it, our next webinar is going to be uh, July 19th. Uh, be aware that that's a date change. So I've had to push it out a week. Uh, we're going to talk about the four C's, one of my favorite subjects, how to manage intangibles and make your you know, intangible asset. What you need to understand is 80% of your value is tied to the, your intangible value. So we're going to need to understand how we manage that and make sure that we can harvest the wealth of that. And I also want to remind everybody, if you're in one of these major cities in the U.S., we have an upcoming owners forum. Would love to see you there. You can get more information by going to business owners or you can go to the Exit Planning Institute's website as well. I want to thank everyone for attending. Hope you got a lot of benefit and I'll see you next month. Over to you. Thank you, Chris. Appreciate it. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, like I said earlier, the webinar will be passed out. Uh, the recording will be emailed to you later today. So look for an email and then and any questions, uh, be more than happy to take those as well. So. Hope everyone has a good rest of the day, a good rest of the week, and we'll, uh, we'll catch everyone soon.